would turn to John chapter 13 this morning. John 13. I didn't mention Ellen and Linda's mom also. Um, I know she had been in the ER. Um, Ellen's mom is um, having difficulty with her leg and pain in her leg and has something to do, I think, with the treatment that she's going through, but continue to lift them up, lift the family up. Um, you know, it's we've been looking at the last several weeks um, what it means to uh, seek the welfare of the city. We've looked at the idea of uh, you know revival, and revival has to happen in each one of us. Revival really is 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 bringing back to life something that's been dead. Um, so when you think of revive, vive means life. Revive means to live again, and and so there's an aspect of that that the revival really is just about bringing us to the place of living a normal Christian life. Um, you know because life is something that God has given to us, uh, and and it's really living the life that we. We've been purposed to live. Even when Jesus says that one must be born again, what's he saying is that, you know, it's like, how, how can I have another life? But the thing is that we need to be birthed in the Spirit so that we can live life as we've been purposed to live. And I think when we look at our culture today, we realize that our culture is in a, a moral life support. Um, you know, with things that are taking place, um, you know, where we, we can see um, you know, some difficulties this week. We've seen uh, you know, all of the riots that have broken out, supposedly peaceful demonstrations, but in the peaceful demonstrations, businesses have been looted. Um, you know, car dealerships have been raised. Churches have been burnt. You know, and, and you say, how, how in the world can people act the way they act and then and then it just creates more tension more people picking sides and creating some things like this but you know what it, it, we are here at this stage of our life um, and having been prepared to do something about it you know, we, we just haven't come into life so that, so that we can try to go in, hide ourselves, do something. And God wants to bring about a change in our culture. He wants to see a, a reformation take place. But it takes you and I, it takes people willing to trust Him to see what we're going to do. And, and the thing is this, if we're going to attempt to do anything that honors God, you have to do it in a way that it honors God. You, you, you must first consider that there's principles by which we serve. And, and I want to really look at this idea today of, of principles. I'm going to share seven principles with us today about Christian service. But first, let, let us look at John chapter 13, verse 13 to 17. Jesus said to his disciples, said, You call me teacher and Lord, and you say, Well, for so am I. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Most assuredly I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who is sent greater than he who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. Lord, we ask you for your mind today as we look at your word and we realize that you're calling us to be a part of the solution, not part of the problem. And so, Lord, uh, as we share these principles, may it bring life to us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like to share with you seven principles, what I would call principles of Christian service. Here we're seeing in the scripture that Jesus is saying there's something more than just hearing my word. But it's following my word. There's something more than saying something. It's about doing something. And what you're doing is required that you do a certain way. Amen? And, and so we're looking at this. And so one of the principles that we realize that in any Christian service is, first of all, is the necessity of a commitment. Because we, we live in a day where everything is exalted but God. You know, there, there was some post on the, on, on the Facebook this week that showed about how people are willing to get up at any kind of time to go for Black Friday shopping. <laughs> but getting up for 9 o'clock service on a Sunday morning is too early. 
it takes commitment, doesn't it? You know, we're, we're committed, but we're committed to different things. And, and so there's a need of commitment. And sometimes you see there, there might be full churches and the pulpit's empty. There, there are a lot of people speaking words, but there are few of those words that are really truths, that are necessary. Many people that are professing faith, but little of that faith is observable as obedience to what God has called us. There are many commitments that are being made, but few that are really committed. And yet commitment is the very cornerstone of Christian service. Commitment, of course, must have an object. If we're going to be committed, we must be committed to something. You just can't be committed to nothing. And true committed Christian service is identified with the person and the purpose of Jesus Christ. Alexander McLaurin said this, The meaning of being a Christian is that in response for the gift of a whole Christ, I give my whole self to Him. There are at least two things involved in this kind of commitment. The, the first commitment is your availability. You, we, we are responsible to be available. Isaiah said to God, you know, in his response, his calling says, Here I am, send me. And Corey Ten Boom said this, It's not my ability, but my response to God's ability that really counts. It's not what I do, what we do that matters, but what a sovereign God chooses to do through us. God doesn't want our success. He wants our commitment. He doesn't demand our achievements. He demands our obedience. And so we recognize that God's calling us to, to be committed. And so the, the first aspect of that commitment is the response to Him of our availability. The second important aspect of commitment is to fully understand the nature of that commitment. We, we need to understand that commitment is not a question of accomplishment. Commitment is, a, is really obedience. It's what God has called us to. Julius Caesar, he landed on the shores of Britain uh, when, with his Roman legions. And he, he took this bold and decisive step to ensure success of his military venture. Because there he, he ordered his men to march to the edge of the cliffs of Dover. And there he commanded them to look down at the water below. And to their amazement, what they saw is every ship that they had come in that they had crossed over the channel was engulfed in flames. Caesar had deliberately cut off any possibility of retreat. And now that his soldiers were unable to return to the continent in which they came from, there was nothing left for them but to advance and to conquer. And that's exactly what they did. And, and, and we'll, when you think about this, to make a true commitment to the purpose and the person of Jesus Christ, there's some ships that we need to burn. There's some things, and you have to ask yourself the question, what's the ship I need to burn? What excuse do I need to put away so I can make this commitment? Because there, there are a lot of things that we put in the front of saying, uh, oh, we, we're going to have, th this is in the way of, of this commitment. I can't do it for this reason. There, there are many times, you know, e even, you know, I was telling my wife that, that for, for Thanksgiving, we're, we're always saying our house is too small. Our house is too small. You know, it's, it's hard to bring people together. Our house is too small. It's like, so we don't have to do Thanksgiving in our house. You do it someplace else. We, we did it here in the church, you know, one of the rooms over here. You know, sometimes we, we have to put away some of the excuses that we come up with. Charles Spurgeon spoke about these dual aspects of commitment when he said this, Faith and obedience are bound up in the same bundle. He that obeys God trusts God. And he that trusts God obeys God. So, so the first principle of Christian service is the necessity of commitment. The, the second one is the certainty of opposition. And some people, because of this principle, they fail to make the commitment because they know that's coming after the commitment is an opposition. But every farmer knows that if you plant potatoes, you're going to have potato bugs. And you can't avoid the potato bugs unless you don't plant potatoes. Yeah, in the area of Christian service, um, we also understand that we have opposition. We have opposition from within and we have opposition from without. First from within, our own nature opposes us in the area of Christian service. 
Usually it opposes us in, in, in one of two ways. One is that we're too busy. What was it that guy said, the acronym for busy? Do you remember? There's something in Satan's yoke or something. Uh, yeah. But, you know, the, the idea, Thoreau said this, it's not enough to be busy, so are the ants. <laughs> I think everybody's busy. The question is, he said, what are you busy about? What are, you, what are you using your time for? Our, our opponent from within us, the other part is that, no, part of it is we're busy, but the other part is that we love comfort. If we're honest with each other, this is true, isn't it? We, we, we want to be comfortable. You appreciate the padded chairs. You're, you're glad that it's not 40 degrees in here, even though 65 might be a little bit too cold for some of you. <laughs> There's a comfort, we, we, we recognize it, but, but effective Christian service will always face some kind of opposition because the scripture says this, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. And sometimes opposition comes dressed as your friends. You ever notice that? You know, it's like they, they'll give you suggestions to do things that will keep you from commitment. Oh, oh you deserve, you, you don't need, you, you do, do, you know, all kinds of different things. Spiritual opposition is uncomfortable, but God hasn't called us to be comfortable. He's called us to be obedient. So we either have opposition that comes from within, but we also have greatest opposition sometimes comes from without. The, the scripture reminds us that anyone who tries to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will face some persecution. And Jesus' opposition oftentimes, look at the, listen to me, oftentimes his opposition actually came from his disciples or other religious leaders. You think about all the different stories of Scripture. You know, the, the kids are crying out, Jesus, and, and the disciples are pushing them away. You know, the, 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 the blind man wants Jesus to come to him, and, and the disciples say, be quiet. They, they criticize Jesus for reaching out to people that they wouldn't be really willing to associate with. They questioned the houses and the parties that he went to. They didn't appreciate him healing on the Sabbath day. They, they did not like Jesus challenging their tradition. And the list goes on and on and on. These are all oppositions that he faced in ministry. But the problems of life oftentimes provide us, however, with opportunities. The, the, the Chinese word for crises means both danger and opportunity. You know that when we go through these different seasons of life, sometimes when we see this opposition, we must recognize that in the opposition, there also might be a great opportunity. And are, are we going to be willing to be committed? Like the, the, the shipwreck fellow many years ago, he, he was working for weeks trying to gather food and provide shelter and only to see the, 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 a spark from his cooking fire burnt his thatched hutch to the ground one night. And, and in anguish he was thinking, he's questioning, says, how can a loving God do such a thing? How could a loving God allow something like this to happen? But early the next morning a rescue ship arrived because he was drawn by the signal fire. Kern Lutzer said this, God often puts us in situations that are too much for us so that we will learn that no situation is too much for Him. God doesn't offer us a way out of the test of life, but He does offer us a way through the test of life. He, he has promised us a, a, a safe landing, but not a calm passage. Uh, you know, sometimes there are the storms. And God uses these adversities to mold us. He uses them to shape us. He uses them to, to make us fit vessels for His service. And so, in Christian service, we have this principle that we need to be committed, but we also recognize that there's a certainty that there'll be some opposition to that commitment. The third principle is the promise of provision. You can simply put it this way. God never calls us to do anything that He doesn't give us the strength to accomplish by the power of His Spirit. If God's called you to do something, He'll give you the strength to do it. If God's called you to do something, He'll give you what's necessary. In our service to God, He'll never demand more from us than what we can do. Because at issue here is the character of the provider. When God calls you to a task, it's His honor that's at stake. It's not yours. We fail to see that sometimes. Many of you think it's all about us. It's not really about us, it's about Him. 
He's the one that's supposed to be glorified. If He's called us to do something, He'll provide it. Why? Because His name is to be glorified. He always provides. It's His, this dependability of God that allows us to take the spiritual risk that we need to take in life because He will provide. For while God will never demand more than you or I can do, He's willing to do much more than we sometimes think possible. Which is why the scripture says he can do above all that we can ask or even imagine. Because God is glorified when you take on something bigger than you. Because his strength is made manifest in your own weakness. If we want to serve the Lord, we have to recognize there's a necessity of commitment. There's also the certainty that there'll be opposition. But remember, there's a promise of provision along the way. One, one more biblical principle is the importance of personal holiness because here we're confronted with the truth that how we serve is important as that we serve. You've seen this oftentimes. Sometimes people are serving, and in their serving, they're, they're yapping and complaining and groaning and moaning and all of this stuff. You might as well just send them home. But how you serve is as important as the fact that you do serve. And, and one of the most extraordinary commands of all of Scripture is this. It says, be holy, for I'm holy. It's an extraordinary command when you think about it, because in ourselves, we are unable. We are not capable of obeying, obeying that command. You know, it's the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit, who by the indwelling in the hearts of the believers, enables us to live a holy life. Like, you can't do it on your own. You don't have the strength to do it, but He can do it through you. Amen. Apart from God, this holiness that I'm talking about is impossible. L Lennon Ravenhood, Ra Ravenhead Hill said this. Listen to this carefully. The greatest miracle God can do today is to take an unholy man out of the unholy world and make that man holy and put him back in that unholy world and keep him holy in it. That God can take an unholy man out of an unholy world and take that unholy man and make him holy and then put him back in that unholy world and keep him holy there. We need to be committed. In our commitment, recognize there'll be opposition, but their great promise is that there's a provision. And it's important as we think about this that we walk in holiness. The fifth principle is this, is that of perseverance. William Arthur Ward gave us four steps of achievement. He said, plan purposely, prepare prayerfully, proceed positively, and pursue persistently. Well, what does it take to persevere in our Christian service? At least two things. One, first of all, is the courage of conviction, because we're called by God to be courageous. When, when he gave his mandate to Joshua, God told him, be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid, do not be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. There's, of course, different kinds of courage. Like the woman who took her husband in interrupting their vacation. She brought him to the dentist. And the woman said to the dentist, I want a tooth pulled and I don't want Novocaine because I'm in a big hurry. Just extract the tooth as quickly as possible. So the dentist was impressed. He says, wow, you're, you're certainly a courageous woman. Which tooth is it? So the woman turned to her husband and said, show me your tooth, dear. <laughs> Different kinds of courage. It, but courage in the Christian service is really another word for faith. The, the basis of our courage is that God says he's for us. It's not against us. In that sense, courage really is just faith flexing its muscles. Because if God is for us, who can be 
against us. The second thing in this need for perseverance, in addition to courage, is our conviction in the perspective of our own Creator. Because in Hebrews 12 we're told we are to run with perseverance the race that's marked out for us. But, but notice in that, in that scripture a couple of things. First, there's a command to persevere. And second, the race has been marked out for us. Notice God has a plan for your life. He's a plan for my life. And the plan for our life is, is tied up with a corporate plan that He has for other people. The, the plan that He has for His church. I, I know that God's plan for my life is tied in the plan that He has for the corporate church. The, the plan He has for your life is tied up into what, what He has for the corporate church. And the only thing you need to do is run your race faithfully. All the while, while what do we do? We, we fix our eyes on Jesus the Bible says is the author and perfecter of our faith. Kind of reminds me of a story of Jan Paderewski. He was a, a famous composer. He was scheduled to compose or he was scheduled to perform at this great concert hall in America and, and, and it was an evening to remember because uh, you know people were in their black tuxedos, long evening dresses, it was high society extravaganza, you know, it's a kind of place that most of us feel like we don't fit in sometimes. But here in the audience was a mother and she had this fidgety nine-year-old. And, and, and we waiting and you know he's weary of waiting and he's squirming and constantly in his seat. You, you, you know what I'm talking about. We've, we've experienced that sometimes maybe, maybe with our own children or with other children. Yeah, as the mother turned to talk with her friends, you know the, the boy couldn't stay in his seat any longer so he slips out of her from her side. Strangely he's drawn to this grand piano that's on the stage. And, and without much notice, all of a sudden, you, you, you have this sophisticated audience, and this boy sits down at the piano stool, and he places his small fingers in the right location, and what does he do? He begins to play chopsticks. And, and the roar of the crowd begins to hush as hundreds of people, they, you know, they have their frowning faces, they're turning in his direction, they're irritated, they're embarrassed, they, they begin to shout, get that boy away from there! Who could bring a kid to there anyway? Why would he bring such a young kid over here? Where is his mother? Somebody stop him. In backstage, the master pianist is overhearing the sounds uh, out front. And he quickly puts himself together and in his mind what's happening. And he hurries, he grabs his coat, he rushes towards the stage. And without one word of announcement, uh, he stoops over behind the boy, reaches both sides of him, and, and he begins to improvise a counter melody to harmonize with the enhanced chopsticks. And all of the two of them begin to play together, and he, he whispers over this young boy's ears, Keep going, don't quit, son. Keep going, keep on playing. Don't stop. Don't quit. This is really what it's like with us. We're hammering away on our projects. Sometimes it must seem to others that what we're doing is playing insignificant chopsticks in a concert hall. The crowds are hardly complimentary. And about the time we're ready to give up, here comes the master. He leans over and he begins to whisper. Keep on going. Don't quit. Don't stop. Keep on going. And he begins to improvise on our behalf. And he provides just the right touch at just the right moment. If we're going to walk in Christian service, we need to know that we need to be committed. Yeah, there'll be opposition, but God will provide. In, in how we do what we do is important. We, we must recognize that we must be, have personal holiness and in doing what we're doing, we need to persevere. <laughs> One more idea is the supremacy of prayer. Prayer oftentimes is the most neglected of all the means of grace, and yet it's the most powerful means of grace. Maybe we don't pray or we neglect prayer because we misunderstand the purpose of prayer. I think sometimes we mistake thinking that prayer is a tool that we use to unleash the power of God. 
And God does oftentimes wait until we seek Him and pray before He acts. But that's not the real purpose of prayer. Perhaps that's why some of you desire power and don't seem to have power. Sir William Temple put it this way, God is perfect love and perfect wisdom. We do not pray in order to change His will, but to bring our wills into harmony with His. Here's the purpose of prayer. To acknowledge our dependency on God and to conform our imperfect will to His perfect will. And when you pray, you don't pray alone. You pray for the Spirit of God to help us and Christ Himself to make intercession on our behalf for the Father. And so we cannot neglect the power of prayer. Jesus said this, apart from me you can do nothing. And the Apostle Paul said this, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. The difference between those two is found in prayer. Where I can do nothing apart from Christ. And I can do all things with Christ. Amen. Amen. We need to recognize and make a commitment. Recognize also that there will be opposition. But you know what? He will provide. There's an importance of personal holiness. We must persevere. We recognize the supremacy of prayer. And the last principle is this. The guarantee of success. Mother Teresa once said, God has not called me to be successful. He's called me to be faithful. We, we must carefully define success in the, in the context of Christian service. And, and that definition has little to do with the world standard. For, for the Christian, success is quite simply this, obedience. Charles Malik had it right when he said this, success is neither fame, wealth, not power. Rather it is seeking, knowing, loving, and obeying God. If you seek, you will know. If you know, you will love. If you love, you will obey. Listen to the words of Erwin Lutzer who wrote this, better to love God and die unknown than to love the world and be a hero. Better to be content with poverty than to die a slave to wealth. Better to take some risk and loss than to have nothing and succeed at it. Better to have lost some battles than to have retreated from the war. Better to have failed when serving the devil. The better to have failed when serving the devil. What a tragedy to climb the ladder of success only to discover that the ladder was leaning against the wrong wall. And T.S. Eliot said this, For us in the trying, for us is the trying, the rest is not our business. We are called to serve, not principally what God will do through us, but what He will do in us. And even though God may, may, may use us to change the world, he, he could change the world all by Himself. What he really wants to do is to change us in the process. For you know that the battle was fought on a hill far away. And there stood an old rugged cross. And at the battle, at that battle, victory was won. The Son of God, the Son of Glory, defeated death, defeated sin. And so when we commit ourselves to serve this living God, we already have the ultimate guarantee of success. It's signed, it's sealed, it's delivered. And here you have it. This is the principles of Christian service. The question is, what are, what are we resolved to do in our own life? Our nation won't be transformed by a new set of laws. But it will be transformed by a next generation of leaders. The question is this, will you be one of them? Does it sound like Mission Impossible? Well, I'll tell you it's not. Maybe you're thinking, if I can't win, I, I don't want to run. Well, let me tell you this, if you don't run, you can't win. And in the hands of God, all things are possible. You want to serve our community? You want to see revival take place? 
put some of these principles in place. Make a commitment. Yeah, you'll have some opposition. It's okay. God will be the provision. Walk in holiness, because how you do what you do is just as important as the fact that you do. Continue to persevere. And all of this, pray. And the guarantee is this, it's not what you do. I think it was John Quincy Adams that said, duty is ours, results is God's. And that's the service that we bring. You do what you're called to do, and let the results be of His choosing. Amen? Amen. Let's prepare our hearts for communion this morning. Father, we thank You. Thank You that we could be together. We thank You, Lord, that You continue to call us to walk with You, to serve You, to be a servant. And Lord, in our service, You transform not just others, Lord, but really what you do is you transform us. And that's what you're after. You're after changed lives, Lord. You're after making us to be alive. So we thank you, Lord. Help us all to make that real commitment to you. Knowing that in you, we can do all things. That we can be strengthened. And that you will enable us to serve those around us and really make a difference. We give you glory praise. In Jesus' name.